Um, so we're going to get started. We're live. Um, Pardon me, sir. Can folks hear me? I was having some microphone into, troubles earlier, uh, but it looks like I'm good now. Okay. You're okay. It sort of goes up and down. Hmm. Curious. Um, we were talking this morning about uh, the what's what? How should I refer to the program? The, Federal level, what is the uh... federal program is called the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Okay. E R A. P E R A P. But we would like to add Emergency Rental and Utility Assistance Program. Okay. So what's the acronym? E R A U P. Yes. Okay, because I don't want to say that whole thing every time. Iraq. So our Iraq. new E R A U P program. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, we've talked a lot in our committee about the tension of getting the money out the door quickly versus giving, um, uh, uh, I could say negatively or positively, giving too much discretion to the executive branch and the structure of the program or more positively uh, saying uh, the legislature would like to have more input in the design. So we'll go with the latter. Uh, and we're trying to balance those interests. Uh, you and the executive branch and the Vermont State Housing Authority have probably heard that, you know, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, we saw it all through the CARES funding. Not only was, did money out the door quickly sort of rule, but then the guidelines kept changing on us. So we're used to doing due diligence and taking our time in designing programs of a half a million dollars, let alone programs of $200 million. So um, we wanna uh, get into that. I think um, I'm hearing just this morning, several people on this call are way ahead of me that some of the administrative dollars you needed quickly, the cost may have gone down somewhat. Um, uh, the latest word is that there'll probably be an interim sort of spending bill so we can sort of balance those tensions a little bit where we don't have to wait until May to get money out the door, uh, but we could also have a, a couple of weeks to give us, give, have some input legislatively on what the program will look like. So with that introduction, um, uh, I, I'm gonna start with Josh, because Josh, actually you're, probably the recipient of the monies and then you subcontract with Richard and he subcontracts with other people. So follow, follow the dollar. I'm gonna start at the top with you and where are things at? Uh, we understand from the pro tem that late last night, the Senate in Washington has gone forward with their 1.9, is it, it must be, 1.9 trillion. trillion. Trillion, right, 1.9 trillion. trillion. Uh, so there's more money probably coming for housing. Uh, take five minutes, give us the lay of the land, Josh. Sure, thank you. So for the record, Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. And certainly a lot has happened since the last time we talked about this program at the round table with the congressional delegation. The one thing that has, hasn't happened is more flexibility for this program. You know, uh, treasury guidance, new treasury guidance has not been issued. We expect something soon, but I think the congressional delegation, you know, made it clear and we've talked to them uh, and follow up that, you know, they're not interested in changing any of the statute uh, requirements in this program. You know, the new 1.9 trillion may have more flexibility and that's coming down the road and we can work on that, but that the general um, program design is in statute and it's already laid out on the federal treasury website. And a number of other states have already started this program, money's flowing. Um, our 200 million has been in the state coffers for three to four weeks now. Um, and I, I will give you a heightened um, sense of uh, despair that you know Richard and I were, were have been commensurating how many nights this week We've been up at one or two in the morning um, replaying the stories we're getting and the calls we're getting, um, knowing this money's there. It is, there is some desperation and there is, you know, landlords that are being forced to provide credit and their small businesses are on the line. You know, they not only are not getting rent payments, 
but they also are responsible for heat, utilities, sewer water bills. Municipalities are putting liens on their property that they can't pay. Um, and so, you know, the eviction moratorium is still in place. We're still in emergency order. And this $200 million is directly um, provided to address these needs. So with that setting the stage, a lot's happened. Um, we have been meeting um, our team, uh, Richard's team, uh, Vermont Legal Aid, Landlords Association, Public Service Department, Agency of Human Service Divisions, and other partners, and have designed a skeleton program design, which is included in the AA1 grant acceptance form that was submitted to Joint Fiscal a couple days ago, signed by the governor, which lays out a plan for spending the full $200 million. Um, that plan includes $110 million for uh, Vermont City Housing Authority for rental assistance and rental rearages, $16 million for the Public Service Department for utility uh, assistance and arrearages, $30 million to Agency of Human Services for uh, uh, those exiting homelessness um, and, and paying for their rental assistance going forward, $18 million for other housing services. This is where we would contract with Legal Aid, Vermont Landlords Association, folks to provide translation services and reach you know, underrepresented populations and a whole host of other discretion. Frankly, this is where the flexibility pot of money could, could be expanded as we get more flexibility. It, it's just a sort of a lump sum that has this general guidance that we could work towards more flexibility as it uh, comes down from Treasury and then proposes to hold 26 million in reserve just for the purposes of expanding the uses of this program and identifying more needs. And the design of this would go to agency of administration as the most efficient way to not have multiple grants and contracts that are transferring between different agencies and departments and, and, and partners that they could be the holder of the money and do direct allocations upon, you know, with um, your appropriation approval. And, and maybe these numbers are only half right now or some other in, in this first, first bill. Um, I've talked to Senator Kitchell this morning, uh, you know, Representative Hooper and others, um, you know, uh, about this. They, they've reached out. Um, and also we've learned more about how this money could be spent. I mean, that 110 million seems huge, but the reality is we have about 76,000 renter households in Vermont. We know that about 60% of those, at least 60% of those are low income. They meet the definitions of this money, meaning they're 80% AMI or below. If we just said, okay, that represents 49 or 50,000 households in Vermont, we could only help 15,000 of those for six months with this 110,000. We can spend this money. The people need, have this need out there. The challenge is getting a robust system that reaches everyone, is easy to access, and we, we can meet the need that's out there with this money and it's no longer oh we don't think we can spend it it's going to sit around there is the need there are the number of households it's a matter of how do we get them all to participate in this program and help meet their basic needs and that's most um, efficiently done through a robust um, marketing and a web-based application system that's easier e easy user-friendly and integrated. What I'm worried about is, you know, we haven't even talked about the utility assistance side. You know, the number from public service department is based on their past program. They know they probably have even more than $16 million in need. We've talked about combining programs, how we can do the application. It, it, what I'm afraid of is if we work at small batches of this money and not look at this plan comprehensively, the public is gonna be confused about what's out there, where to go, all these um, different um, elements of this program need to be delivered at the same time and with some coordination so that the public knows where to go to get these funds, how they're available, and that um, my understanding of this next mini budget bill or what have you that could have a portion of this in it would be, you know, that that's going to, um, you know, 
happen in the next few weeks. And it could be quite a lot of time before there's a, a chance to deploy more money. So, you know, I, I recognize the, um, and respect the policy committees needing to understand where this goes and have an influence on that, hear from everyone, um, you know, and, and then also working through the joint fiscal committees, uh, pressures and time frame and appropriators. And I think we can come up with some balance here that allows a chunk of this money that has some element of each of these four um, pieces that I laid out to have enough money to get started, you know, Maybe it's half of the allocation there. Maybe what, what, that, if, what, if, what, if, what if we gave you all the money with the ability to tweak the program as we went along? Well, yeah, I'll, I obviously we would we would support that. Um, I think that um, you know the the details of of distributing it and how we go back um, the the sort of behind the scenes accounting bureaucracy. Um, I think there's a, we can do some work to get that. Uh, to, to prepare for the most efficiency there. Um, you know, there are so many contracts and programs going out that there could be bottlenecks that we could avoid just by taking a little bit of time to talk to the various players and say, what's the best way to allocate a large chunk of money, um, authorize a certain per amount under each of these programs to go forward now and hold back the rest till we can come back in and check in with you and say, okay, this is going well. This this is the right amount. We don't need any more there. We underestimated this piece. So let's talk about appropriating uh, or releasing a second portion would be a great strategy um, going forward. And then knowing that the new by, the new proposal from DC could have a whole nother set of flexible uses. One thing that's left out here is mortgage assistance right. foreclosure. You know, we have a lot of low income house, households. But we do have some other things in the works. It's not this kind of money, but we have our CDBG money, our coronavirus relief money that we're going to put out just for mortgage assistance because we know we have so much rental assistance and none of this can be used for that. And, and our congressional delegation has been very clear. They don't think they're going to open this back up and try to get that. They're going to deal with that with the new money. And can we use the couple million that we have in CDBG to focus just on the mortgage, knowing that they're left out right now. Um, so we have those flexibilities and, you know, I'm happy to, you know, talk more, about this, bring other folks in with you. I just know that we haven't in this committee brought in the utility component, but yet we've been working with them for a while. And I would hate for us only to move just rental assistance because they go together. In fact, right. the application system that Richard's been talking about has the ability to capture the utility needs right in that same form. It even has the ability to look backwards at previous CRF funds and say, what did you, what was your eligibility considerations for that money? So we can start to calculate, is there any ability to free up some of that CRF money to use for something else? But until we start this program and have a robust system to track all that, we can't even help you help folks to get more flexible money out, if, if, if that makes sense. Well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, I, I, I sense that you feel we're at somewhat of cross purposes. I don't, I don't feel that way. I feel like the numbers may vary as to what we were talking about initially, but uh, at least from personally, I was trying to achieve the same thing. Whether it's $10 million, $25 million, $50 million, let's get this program started and refine it as we go, as soon as possible. And we ran into this complication with administrative dollars where you couldn't spend a significant amount of that $10 million we were proposing on administrative stuff. I don't know if that number has changed or where we are, but I think we're on the same page, but I think this committee has heard preciously little about this program other than what's in the federal law. And, you know, I look back and I see $25 million spent on back rent uh, even before 2020 for a program that is, you could say it's a year long with unrestricted access, and now it's restricted access, and we have $110 million, 
And I'm trying to think creatively, how can, if we don't need all that money, how can we save it and use it towards other needs in housing or state government? And all of those things beg scores of questions that we haven't even started to touch upon in terms of the legislature. And, you know, it sort of feels like, give us this money and go away, you know, and we'll take care of this. Um, so that's the tension that we feel. And um, I think now that I've made my spiel, I'll, I'll, unless somebody has, do you have a question, Keisha? Uh, Keisha has a question. Yeah, um, and then I want to hear from Richard because we yeah. only have 1130. I think it's I think it's related, but I, I mean, what I'm hearing overwhelmingly, and I really hear your passion, Josh, and we all want to get money to people who are, you know, needing um, support and assistance who've been holding on for a long time. We have so much unmet need, and this money won't even meet all of that need. So how then are we prioritizing within the unmet need? what we're going to do with this money. I think that's all I, I wanna hear. Like I, I've heard you say thousands of people and household units, et cetera, are in need. How is this, how do you wanna roll it out so that you, pri you know, what does the priority scheme look like for those who are most in need? That, that's what I feel like I haven't heard yet. Yeah, and Richard can expand on this, but I mean, the federal law is pretty clear that the folks below 50% AMI need to be prioritized first. You know, this is what's so different about this and the CRF money. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've li literally written what we can use this money for. And there are programs that just simply designed around that and are, 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 are moving this money and cutting checks. And that most of these um, software systems out there that have been in the game of providing uh, rental voucher uh, programs since the beginning of rental voucher programs have this down already. They've taken the federal law. They've written software to program and people apply. They answer a number of questions, they, their income and checks are cut and, and, and money's moving because the law requires a prioritization. Just as you said, the most needy first and then up, up the right. ranks of income up to the 80% AMI and it allows you to go forward and to qualify okay. you for months 12 so they, months going they forward. Have, they have to fill out a form. Have we been able to shed any of the requirements of what they have to fill out? Because I think that just presents a huge barrier to people is what we've heard, even if you call them, et cetera. Um, so I'm wondering if they have to fill out a form and if this amount of money you're talking about, something like 110 million is what I'm hearing, would take care of everyone at 50% and then you'd open it up to people at 80%. I mean, are you, how are you talking about rolling it out to meet that need first? Well, I think you could look at the numbers a lot. Like, you know, if everyone below 50% applied and, and received 12 months of rental assistance, it could use all of that 110%, but that's a 100% uptick. You know, that's unlikely even with the most robust program. So it's scalable amongst all those different income levels. You know, all I was trying to express is even at only a... Um, roughly 30% of the eligible households in the state taking advantage of this, it would only provide up to six months of help for only 30% of the eligible households. So, you know, the fact that we only spent 25 million in the first round, you know, Richard's team stood that up in 10 days and used paper applications. This would be a system, therefore the need for this administration dollars that would be robust call centers, people that will help you fill out the application over the phone and data entry right from a phone call. So we don't have to have people mailing in applications, waiting two weeks for the landlord. This would, this, this, this these organizations, these software companies have set this up. For an example, state of New Jersey, their rental assistance program with the CRF money was off to a dismal start. They'd only spent a couple hundred thousand dollars they hired the same group and they got out $90 million of rental assistance in 30 days because folks were eligible and New Jersey state government wasn't meeting the needs. This group came in with 150 employees and got $90 million of rental assistance out in the last month of the CRF eligible date because they, they brought to bear, um, you know, what you can do with that sort of resources. So, yeah. I think maybe right. it's best to have Sean and Richard kind of go into a little bit of details. If, so if maybe, you want to hear. Maybe we should transition to Richard then. Yes. Yeah. Can I, yeah. So Richard, 
let's pick it up from there. You know, what do you need to get the program jump started in terms of dollars and timing, et cetera? Um, and uh, is there a jump start that's not where you're not 100% in, I mean, can we get started and uh, tweak the program as we go and uh, get benefits out uh, partially? I mean, at the same time, there's a lot of enthusiasm for a need to go forward. What's happening here is exactly what I'm talking about. Last week, we never heard anything about these programs. All we heard is that there's like $5 million of need for administrative costs. We didn't, we didn't hear about these new programs, these uh, computer programs. We didn't hear about New Jersey. Every day that goes on, new information comes available. Now we're having a second, a second federal funding. So we need but, to be nimble. But, but I think that's how fast it's evolving, uh, right. Michael. I think, no, you know, so, I know, yeah. so that's, that's the tension again. So Richard, tell us, where we are in terms of standing up the program, administrative costs, what you've, what you're now thinking. Good morning, uh, Chairman Sorotkin and uh, committee members. It's a pleasure to be before you today. Uh, my my name is Richard Williams, and I'm executive director of Vermont State Housing Authority. And as you know, uh, we did administer the uh, the uh, 2020 CRF uh, rental re, re, uh, rental stabilization housing program. Uh, you folks trusted us. Uh, and allocated us uh, $25 million to run that program. Uh, so my apologies. Uh, I got out before this committee before I intended to, uh, but it happened actually on January 14th when, when uh, Commissioner Hanford and I were requested to make an appearance before the Senate Finance Committee. In that committee, you know, uh, was looking at the $2.8 million, which we need to fund the uh, remaining uh, applications uh, that we took in December. And it expanded into the new program, that discussion. And I was, uh, uh, through interrogation in the program, was asked, you know, what, what do you need to stand up the program? And at that time, I had requested $50 million dollars of the uh, full amount of monies that Commissioner Hanford has recommended. I, I think I believe I uh, immediately uh, wrote you over the weekend and apologized for not being before the policy, Housing Policy Committee making that recommendation. It just, it came out through the process that way. Uh, that's the number I've been sticking with, uh, even when I've been asked on the house side of things uh, I know that wasn't the full amount that uh, Commissioner Hanford had asked for, uh, but I thought it was a reasonable amount to start the program because we did spend $25 million in six months. I believe that, you know, that's a, you know, easily uh, obtainable number. I believe we can go further with that, with a robust program, which we did not have, not saying we didn't, we didn't do a good job getting it out, but I can, I know what it, it wasn't uh, the most efficient way to get the money out. And I know it was very difficult to do it with the existing staff that I had. So we have been looking at outside vendors, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, have found some, uh, uh, we were looking at the platforms and, but that didn't give us the people to get the work done. And uh, a new vendor that approached us, actually it was, uh, we were on a, conference call with Guidehouse uh, the other day with the administration and they presented a vendor that is uh, uh, as working in, as, as Commissioner Hanford already said, New Jersey, they're also in Miami-Dade County, you know, Florida, they're doing uh, similar work uh, in California. They have a workforce of uh, 1500 folks that they can, they can tap into at, that work 24 uh, seven. And they have the call centers, you know, the people that they, you know, can talk directly. They can take the applications, you know, online. They can take the applications over the phone. They have access to information that we do not. Uh, like, uh, as you know, some people actually have access to IRS that can verify, you know, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, 
landlords or whatever, you know, a, an EIN number or, or such, and they have access to, uh, you know, GIS platforms to uh, identify where that property is and location, you know, so through that process, uh, you can reduce the potential for any fraud applications. Um, they work on a percentage and uh, it's, it's typically a four to 7% uh, percentage based on the total amount of the ERAP money that they would be administering. You can set up a, you can set up a program for, you know, a smaller program, uh, but the, you know, their, their service fee goes up. It's more like would be 9%. So for example, a $10 million program, it would cost us, you know, 9% for their, their services only. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but they're bringing a lot to the table. You know, they're bringing the workforce, you know, they're bringing full, uh, full access to the program. Uh, they provide a, a, another robust marketing uh, process to get the word out. And, and they also, you know, we have conversations about, you know, the, the new American uh, population, you know, they, I, they have access to 11 different languages and, and, and we'll add any language that we, we choose to do here. Uh, that might not be something as they're, they so, have. So, so Richard, this is, a, this is a company that provides the platform the, and the people. The people, they, they, they do and, everything. And we, for we, we, would process the, we would process the final payment. And the and the larger the program, so if we went with the hundred and ten million to to housing, let's say, I mean, would they handle all, all these other aspects that Josh identified? Would they handle the uh, the utilities and the AHS piece also, or just the housing piece? Well, it really depend on how Vermont wants to design that. Uh, I don't want to throw a wrench into if something is working well with uh, uh, public. Uh, service department and agency of human services, but the application can take uh, it, it, it can go two directions. It can take uh, just the application for rental assistance, but it can also take a, the application for utility assistance. And got it. And, 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 and I, think, so they, I think we I think we would reach more people through that process. Got it. And uh, but I guess what I'm getting at is the larger amount we run through this uh, operation, and I hope you'll give us the name of it in a minute. Um, the smaller the percent is, so you'd say it could be four to seven percent to administer rather than nine percent. Correct. Uh, the more money it runs through, uh, you know, the percentage goes down. Right. Yeah. So well, we could, yeah. Okay. One thing that just you know, important questions being raised here about um, what are we doing about utility assistance? You know, we've only talked in this committee about the rental piece and, and only, you know, whether it's 10 million or 50 million, you know, this all works together as a package, the best way to communicate and the public to not be confused. And what Richard's pointing out is if we launch a rental assistance, a rearage and going forward, it can be at the same time launch the utility. And if we only move just the rental side, we're leaving that whole piece out. And what's different about this utility is it can pay heat, sewer, water, it's much more expansive than the, the uh, system that public service department ran before. And they're aware of that. They've got this $16 million number, which is conservative in this plan. You know, and this, this plan and outline, you know, was from meetings after your round table, what was that, a week or two ago, continuing these discussions, you know, and, and I know I, I shared the, the memo that, you know, is buried in the AA1 you know, grant submission to joint fiscal, uh, you know, with you, Senator Schrock, and a few days ago, so you could see kind of where this plays out. I think the two elements in this plan that aren't as, the numbers aren't um, exact, that you may want to consider holding back more to have more discretion down the road, that uh, 18 million for other housing services, that is not something that we have, I'll be honest, it's not a scope of everything we have. We don't know how much we need to send to legal aid or how much we need to send to Vermont Landlords Association. We just know there's this other housing services that allows 10% after we deduct out the admin and other pieces that we can use for these more flexible areas, which is where the increased flexibility from Treasury 
guidance we're all seeking and waiting for is going to live. Um, and so, you know, in, in my discussions with Senator Kitchell this morning, she was asking about those funds. And, and you know, it, it's true. We do not have that part scoped out, but we know the need is there. And that, you know, if, for example, after some more policy discussions, bringing in the, the public service players and some other partners that you want to hear from, you would you would support some level of 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 this plan, each element getting a half or a third as the initial appropriation to get started, that other housing services one, you may wanna hold back more there um, because we don't, we can't give you the exact numbers of what that 18 million is made up from. May, may I just say that I think the other housing services is critically important to actually the long-term impact of the success of moving people out of homelessness for new Americans, for for people who don't are who are round pegs trying to fit into a square, uh, a square space, uh, th this this uh, this would be uh, and mental health the huge mental health needs. If we can serve those people and solve some of those challenges, we can have permanent impact on some of the housing issues that we've talked about at, in this committee at great length. Very, very so I, I think this committee gets the other housing services big time. I mean. So, uh, Josh, uh, Allison raises a, a good point there. Um, I guess what I'm trying to, what I need to understand, I don't know if you're the right person to ask, but what Joint Fiscal has done in accepting the grant, has any substantive decisions been made other than it will be used in accordance with the federal law have any details been laid out has any breakdown of the appropriation of the 200 million dollars been decided yet or in your mind that's what you're here for today and your conversations with senator kitchell to get some of it out there where you can actually spend the money in accordance with some legislative direction that's the latter, Senator Schrock. And, you know, the, the, the hope is that, you know, the, the, the grant acceptance form lays out the big picture, you know, how much is going to admin. There's some limited service positions hired in, in a few agencies to help move this money. And then the real plan is my little short memo. You know, it's rental assistance and arrearage, utilities, you know, AHS, homeless um, support, and then this other housing services and then a reserve for future allocation. And that the hope was that with coordination with policy committees, you know, you and, and Senator S Stevens committee, that we could um, present, you know, a, a unified plan of perhaps saying, fine, joint fiscal is gonna accept this grant, this 200 million, of course, but that the policy committees would recommend um, allocating half of each of these programs to get started now and reserve the remainder for future um, a future budget um, uh, allocation. And, and you could take more you know, testimony, more discussions and plan for more of it. But the, um, the initial approval just takes into account the federal statute around this, which requires us to serve people below 80%, have a clear preference for folks under and a priority for under 50% you know, takes into account the utility that we can't unfortunately include telephone and internet right now. That's one thing we're hoping Treasury change. If they do, we can come back to you and say, this has been added, let's add more money and, and, and bring that in. Um, those sort of things where we're operating a program with what the feds allow now, with let's just say half, but in each of these buckets so we can stand up a unified uh, program across all elements. I, I know Sean's probably, he's been looking to get in here. He has some details and-, and um, I just wanna be clear. So without some action by the legislature signed by the governor, even though you're accepting this grant for $200 million, at this point, you can't spend any of it. That's my understanding. And I, I think we don't wanna be in a, some sort of power struggle here with we want to get your policy approval to move forward with a good chunk of this it doesn't have to be all of it so we can get get moving okay and and is there any let's assume we did half whatever the number is 
and we put some language in there, sort of like notwithstanding, which we could always do. We pass another law down the road and say, okay, only a third of the half has been spent so far. And now we get new direction from the new federal bill that gives us flexibility to use this money for bricks and mortar and long-term housing development and units. And we decide we don't wanna go at the pace that the original program was stood up at. We, I think we obviously have the right to change that. It may screw up the vendor contracts. It may uh, disappoint some people, but I just wanna know that we have the flexibility as the rules change on us, that as long as we haven't spent that money we've authorized you to spend that we could redirect it in a more nimble fashion. Is that clear? I I don't think we're going to have the opportunity to change how we can spend this money. We may have opportunities with the next pot of money, but this money, it sounds like what Josh has said, the feds have hunkered down on the fact that this money is not going to change how we can spend it. This money is very simple. That that was not my understanding. So clarify that for us, Josh. My understanding was that as of now, the feds aren't changing it, but that as the pro tems letter and other people wrote in the next bill, they were asking to give flexibility back to the December 27th, more flexibility back to the December 27th um, monies that they could, Congress could do that. Congress can amend a law that they passed in December and we were asking them to do exactly that. As of now, we're stuck with what the law is, but that could change in the bill that's going through Congress. And Sean, do you want to? <laughs> so, um, no, uh, so Sean Gilpin with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, from my conversations with uh, our congressional delegation, the message that we're hearing loud and clear is that this, this 200 million um, is, if not set in stone, it's at least set in clay that's drying pretty rapidly. Um, and yeah. they don't want to really re, uh, re-chisel any of that. There is, you know, as has been mentioned, there's um, this uh, 18 million of that that's um, for quote unquote other housing um, services that might get some more flexibility. Basically what we've been told is that the the US Treasury literally on the last day of the Trump administration issued um, a guidance document that laid out a number of questions and some answers to them. And what I've been told um, from uh, Leahy and Senator or Senator Sanders staff and, and Congressman Welch's office is that they expect the treasury will basically go in, change the answers to those questions, but not the questions themselves and not the structure of what the legislation that was passed in December is, is going to do. And a majority of that must go to rental assistance and utility payments um, for people who are at 80% area median income or lower with, with prioritization. And I think the key, um, the key issue right here right now is that in order to create a system, um, to do the logistical groundwork, um, to create a system that can actually service um, that amount of funding for rental assistance, we need, um, we need a certain level of administrative, uh, administrative upfront. And I think one thing that, that I'd like to underscore um, is that if we're allowed to actually build out a, a system that could be um, you know, more accessible, um, better, uh, have, have better staffing than, than what was run for the $25 million program, if we're able to build that out with um, some of these consultants that um, I was actually involved with peppering them with questions the other day as well, um, they actually, uh, to, a, um, to speak to a conversation that you all were having earlier this morning, the reporting ability of that sort of system is going to be dramatically increased over what we've been able to do. So, um, I mean, no knock on Richard's team. He, they put together incredible amounts of data that were uh, collected from the people who uh, applied for this program. And I was uh, privy to a uh, daily uh, deluge of, of spreadsheets um, about updates. But um, this, uh, this group that, um, and it's, it's Nan McKay is one of the, is the um, vendor that we've been, we've been probably most impressed with, I think. 
um, and they, they run a number of uh, housing choice voucher programs in other, other states. Um, so they have some experience in this, but um, the reporting and data availability um, will be vastly superior to what we were able to do with the with the twenty five million dollar program, which I think would actually speak to a lot of the ability to for us to report back to you folks um, to uh, let you know about how the program is going and, and see what tweaks need to be made, um, if if any. Um, so that's that's sort of where where I think we're we're coming from right now. Mr. Chair, hey, Keisha has a question. I'd just be really curious when you peppered them with questions, which is great. Um, you know, my hypothesis is just that people on the lower end of the income scale just have a harder time with staying on the phone and doing forms. Did they have results of being able to say, we reached people across this spectrum between, you know, 50% and 80% or we, we had really good results getting the people who would, would seem to need the most help? That's one question. The second question is, with all of this eligibility around income, are we looking back at people's income from last year or is there a way for them to verify that this is the hit they took this year? Sure, good. both good questions. So on the first, um, first question, uh, the group um, certainly has, as I said, has experience running programs that are, that are targeted towards low-income individuals. Um, they, one thing that they will be able to bring to bear is um, probably several hundred people actually being able to answer phones and walk folks through it, which we did not have before. Um, I do think that um, as um, Josh, as Commissioner Hanford mentioned, um, using some of the uh, quote unquote other housing services funding to contract with Vermont Legal Aid, to contract with the Vermont Landlords Association to have a local um, connection, I think is actually uh, going to be helpful. I think, I think it will. Um, the, the Nan McKay group did, um, I did ask them about language, as Richard mentioned, language availability. Um, they do try to have um, somebody that, it sounds like they have a couple sort of regional call centers. So they do like to have somebody who has um, various different language skills in, in each call center. Um, so we, um, there is demonstrated history of, of targeting towards low income individuals for sure. And I think we would also want to have our own sort of local flavor on how we make sure that folks who might be falling through the cracks get connected with, um, with this organization. Um, to, your, to your second question, forgive me, could you repeat the, <laughs> the second question that you had? Oh gosh, I, I started looking there. at this question. It's income, income yeah, verification. It was, how do you do oh. income verification for this year right. rather than looking right. back since it's Yeah, yeah, the, um, so the way the statute is set up, um, currently and um, I, 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 I don't know if our if our attorney is watching right now um, but he might be shooting me a message as I as I speak to you but um, uh, the way that it's set up is sort of there's there's sort of two tracks um, a person can verify their 2020 income um, for the entire year and basically be pre-approved for a longer amount of time or, um, somebody can apply using their previous month's income and then have to recertify in a three month period. Um, so there is, there is uh, opportunities for both of those options. So it's, it's um, if somebody was, you know, chronically, uh, has been chronically low income, um, perhaps uh, despite the COVID crisis, um, they could use their previous tax, tax year information. If, um, if they are, you know, have hours dropped or, you know, from the previous month, um, you know, and obviously we're going to be operating this through the calendar year. So if something happens to somebody's employment situation in 2021, they would have the option of verifying their income from the previous month um, for, for up to three months worth of assistance before they had to recertify. Okay. So we're going to go on the floor, Josh, uh, I would like you to send us uh, a memo as soon as possible um, with an outline of a proposal that even, in, I, I don't know if it's too late for budget adjustment or a bill that would come out very quickly for the minimal amount that you would need that would meet your needs and the needs you've heard expressed here. And then that's one scenario and the other would be more of the optimal amount that you think we should do. Right. Those are 
and what the pros and cons are of those two. And that's about is all we can do in the next two minutes. We're all housing advocates. We all want to spend all the money and we want to get people help as soon as possible. But we also want to have some input in terms of that certainly that $18 million, maybe if there's more discretion as things we learn more and we go forward, we wanna have that flexibility too. So we've got some practical and ideal tensions maxing, but if you can send us a, a page and a half memo on two scenarios uh, like that, uh, we'll, we'll pick it yeah. up. Even if, even if budget adjustment has sailed, I think it, it probably wouldn't, I don't know if it, we're talking, I don't, I haven't heard that we're talking about it on the floor today. So <laughs> it's going to go into next well, week. We'll so. hope we can impact it. And this isn't general fund money. This is the money that's in the bank right. waiting for us to spend. Chairman Sarat, I just, uh, just a yes. uh, I heard that the 10 million came out of that Budget Adjustment Act. So yeah. I, well, the Budget Adjustment Act has not passed yet. I yeah. heard it come out as well because in deference to a second bill where several situations are like this that are pending that would give the policy committees a little bit more time, but not certainly waiting until May. So, right. um, but yeah, things, January things, rent things, is now. Things, things change. So it's not, the, the ship is not fully sailed, but if it had, if it's gonna sail, there'd be another boat right behind it. So, uh, but why don't we do that? We really have to go to the floor. I apologize. It's 1127, yeah. Can okay. you get us, if you're gonna go with Nan McKay, the website's just pretty general. If you could get a one pager on what other states they're working with and how they do, we this. could probably get the PowerPoint that they provided. Um, and you know, I'm sure we'll have to go through some contracting procurement. So we shouldn't be saying we're going to go with, with with them. It's just been most impressive of the robust work and that their entire um, platform is based on rental assistance since day one for 30 years. So it wasn't like. They're Johnny come lately and mm -hmm. jumped into all this relief money. They've already been doing this and said, we should switch to help people move this money fast. Yeah. Right. One, of the, one of the things in, in terms of your memo that I hope I won't, won't see is that these providers are saying that you got to put all this money up front right now to get a real favorable deal. I, 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 I think there could be a clause put in any contract that says we're anticipating expanding this and this is what we would get if we right. ultimately do expand it rather than put all your money up right now. Right. If I want to see that impediment. Great. Right. Thank you. Flexible. Thank you.